by SDN Feast. I have to admit, I had to look that one up. I did not have a course in college in Greek mythology. Um, my guess is it's not so much a household name <coughs> for you. But some of you may know. Well, uh, according to what I read, Thyestes had an affair with his brother's wife. And his brother Atreus was none too happy about that, as you might imagine. So Atreus uh, kills Thyestes' sons and cooks them up in a pie and serves them to their unknowing father for dinner. So a Thyestean feast is another word for cannibalism. Since Christians claim to be eating the body and drinking the blood of Jesus, who they also refer to as the Christ child, born in a manger, their Lord is a baby they worship, it's no small wonder that some folks thought Christians were cannibals who ate babies. Yeah, I know, it's crazy, huh? You think Christians get a bad rap today? I'm telling you. Tertullian, in his apology, says this, Monsters of wickedness, we are accused of observing a holy rite in which we kill a little child and then eat it, in which after the feast we practice incest and dogs overturn the lights and get us the shamelessness of darkness for our impious lust. And then he goes on to say, our feast, our feast explains itself by its name. The Greeks call it agape, love. Whatever it costs, our outlay in the name of piety is gain, since with the good things of the feast, we benefit the needy. Love feasts. Now, this is the early church, the first couple of hundred years. But if you look closely in the Bible, you'll discover that this idea of the Christian practice of, of eating bread and drinking wine at a love feast was not always on the up and up. And it was a problem even from the very beginning, even from as early as the Corinthian church. You know the words that our elders are going to say at the table this morning here in a few minutes <clears throat> that they say every Sunday? Do you know where those words come from? They come from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. They also are used in the Gospels when Jesus has the Last Supper with the disciples. But the exact words that we use at the table every Sunday are Paul's words in his <clears throat> first letter to the Corinthians chapter 11. And they are preceded by these words. Now in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better but for the worse. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Do you, do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, and you know the rest of the story. That's from 1 Corinthians. In Jude, the letter of Jude, there are some people who are apparently giving Christianity a bad name. And Jude says, these people are blemishes on your love feasts, feasting with you without reverence, caring only for themselves. They're waterless clouds swept along by the winds, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, completely dead. Why don't you wish Jude would say what he really thought? <laughs> it's the age-old problem of religion. Some people get it, some people don't. We all gather at the table for different reasons. Some people are just hungry. Some people come and gather around the table just because for the first time in their life they see enough bread to eat and to spare. And they've never known that kind of generosity. They've never known that kind of abundance. They've never known that kind of extravagant welcome where there's always a place at a table for somebody like them. You know that favorite hymn of ours? There's quite enough love in this very room. There's quite enough love for all of us. We could sing in this very room, there's quite enough bread for all of us. In this very room, there's quite enough of the bread of life for all of us. But some folks come to the table of religion looking for the next new thing. Just trying to make a connection, <coughs> cut a deal, 
build a network, look good on paper, maybe just be fashionable. That's one of the church charges that get leveled against the church all the time. What's the word that gets used? They're a bunch of hypocrites. Look churchy on the outside, but that's not what they're there for. Then there are those folks who are downright gluttons and parasites. They come to any place of worship to consume and 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 no matter what the church gives them, it's never enough. They're never satisfied. Not because the bread isn't good or satisfying, but because their God is their own belly and nothing more. I believe Paul says something about that in his letter to the Philippians. It kind of sort of gives me encouragement that the problems we have in the church today have been around since the very beginning. It's not just us. But then, while there are probably other groups besides those that I've named, there is one group that I know exists in every house of worship. There are those who come to the table seeking more than just comfort, seeking more than just food, even seeking more than just comfort food. There are those who come to the table looking for soul food. Like the kind Jesus promised in our text this morning, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you abide in me and I in you. Contemporary English version says, you are one with me and I am one with you. The living Father sent me and I have life because of him. Now everyone who eats my flesh will live because of me. Haven't you ever heard of those story, those uh, studies that are out there like experiencing God? Um, um, the Course in Miracles, right? You've heard of some of these things. Uh, Bible Study Fellowship. There's various and sundry groups all around. Why? Because people want to know God. We want, to, we want to ingest the Word of God, consume the Word of God, be consumed by the Word of God, and to know God. We want to be one with God. That's the soul food we're looking for. Now, let me try to put this a little differently. I want to, t I want to tell you, uh, share with you a portion of a sermon from one of the preachers I, uh, who, who's a great um, inspiration to me, and that is Frederick Buechner, his Presbyterian minister, um, retired now, many, many years got to be in his late 80s, if not 90s. He has a, a sermon in which he talks about this desire to, to know God, to seek God. And it, his sermon is actually on John 14 instead of John 6, but it fits. Because in John 14, Jesus says to the disciples, you will seek me. Fred says, and here's his sermon, a portion of his sermon. We seek for answers to our questions. Questions about life and about death. Questions about what is right and what is wrong. Questions about the unspeakable things that go on in the world. We seek for strength, for peace, for a path through the forest. But Christians are people who maybe more than for anything else seek for Christ. And from the shabbiest little jerry-built meeting house in the middle of nowhere to the greatest cathedrals, all churches everywhere were erected by people like us. And the wild hope that in them, if nowhere else, the one we seek might finally somehow be found. Fred goes on to tell a story. He says, a friend of mine told me about a Christmas pageant he took part in once when he was rector of an Episcopal church. Like most Christmas pageants, Mary was there in the blue mantle, Joseph in a cotton beard. The wise men were there with a handful of shepherds. And of course, in the midst of them all was the Christ child lying in the straw. All went like clockwork until it came time for the arrival of the angels of the heavenly host as represented by the children of the congregation who were all robed in white and scattered throughout the pews with their parents. At the right moment, they were supposed to come forward and gather around and sing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill among men. And that is just what they did. Except there were so many of them that there was a fair amount of crowding 
and jockeying for position. With the result that one particular angel, a little girl about nine years old, who was smaller than most of them, ended up so far out on the fringes of things that not even by craning her neck and straining on tiptoe could she see what was going on. Glory to God in the highest and on earth goodwill among men, they all sang on cue. And then in a momentary pause that followed, the small girl electrified the entire church by crying out in a voice shrill with irritation and frustration and enormous sadness at having her view blocked. Let Jesus show! There was a lot of the service still to go, but my friend the rector said that one of the best things he ever did in his life was to end everything precisely right there. Let Jesus show, the, cry, the child cried out. And while the congregation was still sitting in stunned silence, he pronounced the benediction. And everybody filed out of the church with those unforgettable words ringing in their ears. Let Jesus show! There is so much for all of us that hides Jesus from us, Fred says. The church itself hides him. All the hoopla of church with ministers is lost in the thick of it as everybody else so that the holiness of it somehow vanishes away to the point where services of worship run the risk of becoming only a kind of performance. On some Sundays better, on some Sundays worse. And only on the rarest occasions does anything strike to the quick the way that little girl's cry did. With every last person who heard her realizing that Jesus didn't show for any of them. The mystery and the miracle of Jesus with, with all his extraordinary demands upon us, all his extraordinary promises to us. I love that sermon, friends. That's not all of it. You've got to read the whole thing sometime. And it caught my attention. The miracle and mystery of Jesus with all his extraordinary de demands upon us and all his extraordinary promises to us like eternal life for those who eat the soul food of this love feast. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever and the bread I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Those are hard words. Those are outrageous words. And those of us who eat that bread and drink that cup are making an outrageous claim. If you were raised Catholic, you may have been taught that that outrageous claim is the doctrine of transubstantiation. Where upon eating the host and drinking the wine, the bread becomes the actual bones of Jesus in your mouth. And the wine, or in our case, juice, becomes the actual blood of Jesus in our mouth. And with various churches, I mean, this has been an argument. I don't, that's a whole other sermon series and all the different ways that people understand eating that bread and drinking that cup. But uh, particularly in those traditions where there's a lot of liturgy and incense and words, special words that are said and things that are done around communion, you eventually had some people call it a bunch of hocus pocus. You ever heard that? You know where that comes from? Hoc et corpus meum. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm no Latin scholar, so I may be pronouncing that incorrectly, but hoc et corpus meum. Ma'am, this is my body. That phrase, hoc et corpus meum, eventually became hocus pocus. In a slant, right? Meant to deride. Now, I'm not here to tell you what to believe about that. We're disciples. What we believe is that table belongs to Jesus. And what happens at that table is between you and Jesus and the minister and the elders and nobody else gets to tell you 
what that is. That's between you and Jesus. But I do think that one of the things I love about disciples is that much like Catholicism, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, is the center of our worship service. It is our core identity. We are a people of the open table. We claim that we are transformed by eating that bread and drinking that cup, no matter how we think about it, because we are transformed by the living presence of Jesus himself, who welcomes all to the table. And so we, though we may have prejudice and difference and sin and every manner of horridness, we welcome all to the table as Christ has welcomed us. When we eat our lunch here in a moment, or if you're going to skip lunch, the next time you eat a meal, the food you eat will become a part of your body. When you eat the Lord's Supper here in a moment, the opposite will happen. The Lord's Supper will become, we will become, sorry, excuse me. When you eat your meal, the food will become a part of you. When you eat the Lord's Supper, you will become a part of the Lord. When we eat the bread and drink the cup, we embody the living God we proclaim in the resurrection of Jesus Christ through ourselves as the body of Christ. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, it, it could be a meaningless ritual, but if you know that this is the bread of life, then when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're committing your very body to embody Jesus. Every time we eat his flesh and drink his blood, we let Jesus show. Every time we eat his, eat his flesh and drink his blood, we let Jesus show. We care for others as he cared. We forgive each other as he forgave. We love each other as Jesus loved. That's why it's called a love feast. Because we're literally feasting on love. Communion is a central element of Sabbath experience. In the Jewish tradition, Sabbath is, contrary to popular belief, not a time to refrain, but a time to enjoy lavishly, to eat extravagantly, to pray extravagantly, to love extravagantly, and to rest extravagantly. My friends, you're invited today to have some soul food on this Sabbath day. Eat differently this week. Choose to have a love feast in your life this week. When you eat that bread and drink that cup today, make a commitment to let Jesus show. So much so that somebody might say, well, those Christians, they're just cannibals. <laughs> This morning, my devotion, my morning devotion was on this text. And a guy wrote, the author wrote, I'm tempted to spiritualize to say Jesus sustains us the way other bread from heaven sustained God's people. But it's more than that. It's more solid, more sordid here in John. Less vegetarian. <laughs> it's incarnation at its root in the flesh. Jesus gives his body for the life of the world, his beefy heart, the marrow of his bones, his lifeblood. And we, the body of Christ, receive our own call, bite by bite. 
to rise to new life and be consumed, to give our lives, our bodies, to one another in the name of love. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I share that with you as a devotional thought to open our prayer time this morning. To take bite by bite. To give yourself for the life of the world. In this time of prayer, uh, as Becky leads us in singing our prayer song, our, our voices, our, our music, is a time to be consumed by God. You may also light a candle, one of the candle screens. There's a prayer box in the back. There's a blessing board on the wall. These are all ways that you can let Jesus show and be consumed by Christ and taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us pray.